Welcome to our Curious Amalgam, the weekly podcast brought to you by the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. Our Curious Amalgam explores the fascinating and increasingly overlapping world of competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law. Each week, we bring you leading global experts on the most compelling issues of the day. Enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome to Our Curious Amalgam, the podcast from the American Bar Association Antitrust Law Section. My name is Christina Ma, and today's topic is an overlooked battleground, Antitrust Issues Before the U.S. International Trade Commission, otherwise known as the USITC. The USITC has been a familiar forum for parties and disputes involving intellectual property and proponents of the USITC believe it can be similarly used as a forum to address antitrust disputes. In this episode of Our Curious Amalgam, we'll explore what the USITC is and how it could be and is used to resolve a host of disputes, including antitrust disputes. Joining me today is my co-host, Anora Wong. Hey, Anora. Hi, Christina. So who? what are we talking about today? <laughs> USITC, a uh, much familiar forum for people uh, who, who uh, help clients navigate them through uh, international trade and intellectual property disputes, but not so much for people who are solely practicing in antitrust realm. So, uh, but like, you know, we do have people who is interested in both and who has unique experience to, to give us a little bit of their perspective. Great. And who's our guest today? Our guest, Professor F. Scott Keefe, is a Fred C. Stevenson Research Professor of Law at the George Washington University Law School, and he is a former commissioner of the USITC. Professor Keefe was nominated to the USITC uh, by President Barack Obama, and he has served the agency during 2013 to 2017 before returning to teaching at the law school. Before serving the USITC, Professor Keefe also spent time at the Stanford University Hoover Institute institution, where he focused on issues including intellectual property and innovation. Uh, and also Professor Keith practiced law as a trial uh, attorney and patent attorney and served as advisor to high-level government offices during the Bush, Obama, and Trump presidential administrations uh, on national security and economics. So a stellar resume, which I'm not going to read through, but uh, well, the takeaway is that we're informed by his unique experiences in uh, both academia and also the USITC. Uh, we're going to learn from his insights and perspectives of um USITC, uh, an overlooked area for antitrust practitioners. Wonderful. Well, Scott, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Christina and Honora and the other organizers. This is a great uh, chance to chat. I appreciate joining the conversation. Yeah, pleasure is all ours, Scott. Uh, I just want to make sure that we are uh, structuring our conversations around several high-level questions. So this may sound very basic to you, but do indulge us a little bit. Let's start with a very uh, brief discussion on, I guess, the missions and or the organic law, I guess, of the ITC as an agency first, uh, especially like what kinds of disputes usually come before the ITC. Sure. So uh, the ITC is one of these many three-letter commissions inside the Beltway, inside the U.S. government. There are a bunch of these three-letter groupings in the alphabet soup. Uh, uh, Folks in the antitrust world may be more familiar with the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC. Folks in the corporate world may be more familiar with the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Folks in the telecom world may be more familiar with the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. So then what is the ITC, the International Trade Commission? Well, I think first of all, it is um, one of these three letter commissions. These are all often called um, bipartisan or independent commissions in that they are led by a group of presidentially nominated Senate confirmed commissioners from both parties. But while most of those other three-letter commissions, including the Federal Trade Commission, came out of the New Deal, um, the ITC was actually um, uh, born... Um, with a predecessor Mm -hmm. after the Civil War, um, a much earlier time. And and that difference in time um, matters a little bit 
because the ITC has a different structure. So most of those other commissions, including the Federal Trade Commission, sure, they do have often commissioners of both parties, but their full set, their full roster is usually an odd number, five. And of course, an odd number doesn't split evenly. Mm -hmm. So there's always a majority in the president's party. Right. And their chairs um, usually are um, much more responsive to the president because of the term of the chair uh, and the power to appoint and remove through the president. Um, the ITC has an even number of commissioners, six. It's required by statute to have a chair that rotates person and party every two years, even if the president doesn't designate. And so the ITC is structured in its statute very differently than those other commissions and boards. Um, and that structure has a huge impact on how the ITC functions. Um, and it wasn't an accident. Um, the, the chairman of the economics department at Harvard at the time uh, after the Civil War uh, was an, uh, an economist who studied political science as well, a fellow named Frank Taussig. And he, he wrote about structuring an agency then called the Tariff Commission mm -hmm. to be uh, in equipoise, to have this powerful tension inside it as a way to resolve that kind of tension with um, written opinions and record evidence rather than with policy preference. Mm -hmm. um, so, that, so that's, what a, are the, that's a big difference. Yeah, no, I, I think the structural difference is probably critical and, and people gave a lot of thought to it. What are the the, the critical issues that, that folks thought really needed to have that bipartisan um, approach and sort of what's within the purview or the jurisdiction of the ITC? Sure. So the ITC does does a couple of different things. Um, it manages the tariff schedule of the United States. Um, it adjudicates um, import disputes really of two types. Um, one category that are um, very well known to trade lawyers around the world. Most countries have this category of dispute, something um, akin to what we in the U.S. colloquially call anti-dumping and countervailing duty disputes. And, uh, and then the second major category of disputes um, is colloquially called the 337 docket at the ITC, Mm -hmm. And that includes intellectual property disputes and the topic of today's discussion, um, um, more formal antitrust analysis. Yeah, I think that that connects well to what we want to discuss in the beginning, right? Like ITC is a quasi-judicial federal agency. It has a judi uh, adjudicatory portion of its docket. And uh, I, I think like both the, the title seven portion and a section three, three, seven portion, they're both like, you know, with the, the languages written in the statute, they're both broad enough. But in your opinion, uh, the section three, three, seven docket of the ITC may embrace private antitrust disputes, right? And so maybe it's worth investing a little time to go to languages or, or uh, just explore what exactly is covered under section three, three, seven, right? Sure. So, so um, Section 337 um, in its um, version uh, that, that people are most familiar with, especially in the antitrust community, um, is really written with language that's very similar to the FTC Act Section 5. It yep. talks pretty, pretty broadly about harm to the U.S. market. And, and the words that, like the key, the operative phrase there is that... Um, Section 337 governs unfair methods of competition and unfair acts in the importation of articles, right? And unfair methods of competition, it's, it, it's almost exactly from, uh, but like the Section 5, the FTC Act. But 
same words, are they actually meaning the same things? How should that be interpreted uh, within the context of Section 337 and before the USITC? You know, it's funny. Um, um, often in um, IP uh, community uh, debates, uh, there was focus on um, the patent office and the district courts. Often in antitrust community uh, debates, there has been focus on the Department of Justice Antitrust Division and the Federal Trade Commission. Mm -hmm. um, but then um, what is interesting is in each of these areas, there's been a, an effort to, to reach out and touch um, <laughs> all, all the um, other parts of uh, government and uh, areas of law and, and, um, and frankly, other jurisdictions outside of the U.S., and so um, the antitrust community inside the U.S., the Federal Trade Commission, for example, using its unfair methods of competition authority, um, has at least through the acts of individual FTC commissioners mm -hmm. reached out to the ITC to assert um, lots of relevance um, and, and the funny thing about relevance is, um, it's a two way street. Um, mm -hmm. so if what the, uh, ITC is doing is determined to be so vitally relevant to what the FTC does in exercise of the FTC's interpretation of even the FTC's own statute yep. using the exact same language you just described. If that's so antitrust relevant when it involves only Title 35 or patent issues, it's got to be more relevant when it involves Title 15 antitrust issues. And sorry, this is perhaps a, an obvious question. Um, it is the International Trade Commission. Does the language of Section 337 require some international dimension to the enforcement of that section. Yeah, absolutely, totally. Um, the um, ITC uh, docket is exclusively focused on how things coming into the country impact activities inside the country. So a uh, necessary limit on the ITC's power is that there must be an importation. Right, right. I want to focus uh, back a little bit on the uh, unfair methods of competition language just a little bit. I, I know uh, I gathered from your response to my previous question is that like, you know, FTC and ITC at times through individual commissioners, there might have been some communications on like, you know, how they exercise uh, their authorities and how they interpreted the, the words in their uh, respective organic laws. But uh, sounds like there is no agreement, right? <laughs> There's definitely uh, not as much clarity as uh, the business community would want, right, in case we're considering both ITC and FTC as potential forums for antitrust uh, private, like, you know, uh, dispute adjudications. But uh, so so do you foresee, like, you know, USITC, I guess we're jumping the gun a little bit. If uh, USITC is used more as a um, place to resolve antitrust issues, and, and then in case I, I, ITC interprets the words or whatever comes under the words a little differently than the FTC. What about it? How, how would those like, you know, uh, clashes be resolved? Well, I mean, I think there are a couple of issues you're raising here. So one is what counts as an unfair method of competition. Yep. Another is, um, uh, are all unfair methods of competition, um, adjudicated, adjudicatable, mm -hmm. able to be adjudicated before yeah. all tribunals. Um, and, and then a third is what if multiple tribunals handle similar issues? Does the world stop spinning and do cats and dogs live together and, right. and you know, catastrophe ensue? And, you know, I, I think we've seen that we can walk and chew gum at the same time and that multiple agencies can can handle the same topic and have different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And uh, to some degree, 
their perspectives and their actions may overlap and to some degree they may differ. So I think it's important to break these things down piece by piece. Um, and so as, as, as we started a little bit, um, uh, you know, what counts as messing with our markets or right. unfair competition. Yeah. Um, and then what component of that is focused on the ITC? What component is the, the component of our market that is impacted by imports? That would be the part that goes to the ITC. Um, and, and on the question of how to resolve conflicts, there are going to be two categories of conflicts, roughly speaking. There'll be um, ideas that differ, mm -hmm. and then there'll be specific actions and specific matters that differ. And of course, it's hard for a given party to, um, to follow um, tribunal number one that says you must not and tribunal number two that says you must. Mm -hmm. uh, if that kind of um, hyper- um, schizophrenic conflict were to ensue, um, you know, gosh, we, we'd be sympathetic about that party. Um, but of course, there are also reviewing courts. Uh, mm -hmm. The typical um, FTC action will be reviewed by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, and the typical ITC 337 action will mm -hmm. be reviewed first by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. But of course, both of those courts get reviewed by the Supreme Court. Um, so there, there is um, opportunity for um, um, a single tribunal to review. And of course, those courts have, um, at the patent antitrust interface, met each other before um, in cases having nothing to do with the ITC. So, so that, that's not a new ITC issue. Right, right. Thanks for breaking that down for us. I, I think it's a good reminder that we need to uh, take issue one by one. Let's take maybe like, you know, better understand the current docket of the ITC under its Section 337 uh, portion. Uh, so so right now, the reality is that most of, of those cases or issues of intellectual property law, is that right? And why is that? Is it like, you know, a, a historical coincidence or is why, why is almost all of all of that, it, uh, all, all of ITC Section 337 portions is, is about intellectual property? Sure. So um, there have been more recent amendments um, to the ITC 337 statute that made it um, more clear in the ITC statute that um, particular um, legal doctrines relating to injury were, in effect, statutorily presumed if the um, gravamen, the core legal complaint, um, hinged on the statutory forms of intellectual property that were then named in the 337 statute, so patents, trademarks, copyrights. Um, and so um, it is in that regard, easier to get a 337 case started if the case hangs on a statutory form of intellectual property. Um, but, but in the in the paper um, that I wrote, that I think stimulated that may may have helped stimulate this discussion among yes. us. Well um, it, and, we're going to put it, a link on the web page uh, in case you, uh, the the e the eager listener who is trying to <laughs> learn more, we're going to put a link to Professor uh, Keeves' articles so you can learn about it. Sure, and 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 just that what what stimulated today's discussion, I think, was a, a statutory antitrust case being brought at the ITC, um, mm -hmm. and. Um, and in the particular ITC case um, in question, a case involving steel coming in from China, um, the there were some really interesting, to me, debates about whether the ITC had the power, and even if it had the power, whether it had the prudence, um, whether it was a good idea to use that power uh, in the context of a of a, um, a private cause of action, a 337 
complaint initiated by a private party um, uh, arguing a relatively straightforward antitrust argument um, against um, Chinese importers or importers from China, uh, imports themselves from China. Um, so first of all, that was a case involving entirely imports. So in answer to your earlier question, is the ITC meddling in U.S. markets when it acts? Well, the only thing the ITC can do is in that definition, meddle in U.S. markets. That's its entire job. But its entire job in this docket is only when there are imports. That was a case where the only thing was imports. Um, so that that it seems a bit of a red herring to worry uh, <laughs> about the the nexus to an import when there are that many imports. Um, I, I think that the next piece of that case is that people seem to really worry that that was a predatory pricing case mm -hmm. and that inside U.S. antitrust practitioners' ordinary toolkit is the um, notion that for a private party to um, even bring a predatory pricing case, they yeah. first have to prove, um, plead and prove uh, below co cost pricing plus mm -hmm. a chance for recoupment. Mm -hmm. And the focus of my paper, which, as I mentioned in that paper, was actually written as my opinion when I was adjudicating that case, I left the commission before the case finished. So I published my opinion, not as a government official, I published it as a private citizen. Um, but I had already written it. So I figured it, it, it was <laughs> it was worth uh, showing people precisely to stimulate conversation so that if it was wrong, we could all learn what was wrong about it. Um, like everyone else, I get to be wrong too. Um, and, um, the, the focus of that paper was to ask, gosh, um, first of all, um, whatever the arguments are about predatory pricing, that was actually pled not as a predatory pricing case. Mm -hmm. So why are the arguments about predatory pricing even relevant to a case that on its own terms is not about predatory pricing? And um, I think that was a, a, a central point of uh, either disagreement or confusion um, in, in that case. Yeah, I think, um, first of all, a little backgrounder. So the, the case that Scott was referring was, uh, I think, like, you know, the opinion of the ITC came out in, in March 2018 and, and somewhere um, around the time that uh, Scott left the commission. And then the case's name is Car uh in re, I guess, certain carbon alloy steel products. And, and the, the, the issue there, I think you just raised about injury and also like, um, I guess more about like, you know, how it's understood, predatory, uh, predatory pricing case is understood on the antitrust laws. It's actually very on point, uh, uh, I guess, like, you know, uh, to, to showcase what, what the potential clashes might be uh, between the ITC's jurisprudence and the FTC's jurisprudence of uh, unfair methods of competition, right? So we understood that, like, you know, from the ITC stock, at least about intellectual property cases, injury is not something that has to be uh, alleged or, or proven, right? It's, it's assumed, but it's not so much clear for anything else other than intellectual property law. Maybe I'm, I'm reading the languages wrong or, or the legislature history, uh, it's subject to different interpretations. But isn't that the issue that antitrust practitioners might worry? Like, you know, for, for antitrust case, the antitrust injury is very critical, right, for the plaintiffs to, to allege and, and prove. And then now, if it, it has been dressed up as a Section 337 case in front of ITC, would the same antitrust issue still be required, um, sort of like an important element for the plaintiffs to allege and prove? Even sure, if so it's not an intellectual property case. Yeah, so this concept of antitrust injury grew into the antitrust jurisprudence when we um, wanted to see and did see private litigants bringing antitrust cases. 
and mm-hmm. antitrust injury as a do- as a doctrine or a concept um, exists for a very specific and and I think good reason, which is um, the cost of litigation, including lawyers to bring it and uncertainty for businesses around it, those costs are high. And antitrust injury is a doctrine that antitrust law uses as a gatekeeping function to ask an important question, is the particular plaintiff in a particular case really only helping themselves or are they a fair, a good proxy for harm to the market as a whole. And the antitrust injury doctrine is a doctrine that in effect asks, is this particular plaintiff injured in an antitrust way, in a way that injures where the injury to the complainant is a good proxy for the injury to the market? Mm -hmm. so that we as a system can comfortably conclude that going ahead and spending all of this lawyer time and all of this uncertainty, um, that spending that is going to serve a good end. It's going to protect the market. Mm -hmm. So antitrust injury on the one hand serves to um, this powerful gatekeeping or proxy function on the Mm -hmm. other hand. The what what is um, key to asking that question in the first place is that antitrust law, mm-hmm. um, substantive antitrust law, um, creates a lot of incentives for let's call it um, um, uh, um, antitrust complainants who are not good proxies. <laughs> Um, that's that's to, a, to, sort of a nice way to address it. <laughs> yes. Um, some people would call them bad actors. Um, mm-hmm. to, um, to use the threat of litigation. Um, and, um, and that's because the, the, um, the statutory antitrust provisions that allow right. these private rights of action right. give these private complainants access to possible remedies that Mm -hmm. help them a lot and hurt defendants a lot. Um, So trouble damages and attorney's fees are Mm -hmm. the, are the key um, culprits here. Well, uh, trouble damages and attorney's fees are, are not um, on the table in an ITC 337 action Mm -hmm. where what is on the table is a possible exclusion order. Right. So you don't have the sword of Democles Mm-hmm. In addition, um, um, the the underlying um, need for proxy effect, mm-hmm. which again may indeed even absent attorneys' fees and statutory damages still be relevant in a predatory pricing case, mm-hmm. is an entire red herring when the case is not about predatory pricing. When the case is about broad spectrum collusion over yeah. price and yeah. output. And in that steel case, the gravamen of the complaint was collusion. And the collusion cases do not require this antitrust injury <laughs> recoupment doctrine. Um, so I think there was a lot of accidental or intentional misdirection in this steel case where there were a lot of arguments about right. um, recoupment, but it wasn't a recoupment case. It was a collusion case. Right. I, I think I appreciate the, the bigger picture of, of uh, discussion of incentives of the different bodies of laws. I think that's important. And you have alluded to the travel damages and attorney's fees in interest cases, which is usually what we th- we say a very, very heavy hammer. And then that incentivize certain plaintiffs. But in the ITC context, some might argue it's very powerful, like, you know, as potential remedies uh, goes, right? It's very powerful in the ITC context as well, because uh, what, what are we concerned about? Uh, exclusion order, right? Maybe you can explain that a little bit, how that works, what parties get out of an ITC proceeding and how that's potentially 
powerful too? Yeah, sure. ITC 337 actions are not without their sharp teeth. Um, There are um, two main categories of remedy that people worry about in these 337 cases, regardless of the underlying area of law that forms the complaint, whether it's an antitrust argument or a patent or trademark argument. Um, But the the remedy can be um, either an exclusion order, an order keeping goods Mm -hmm. out of the United States market. Um, Of course, if they're made in the U.S., that's different. Uh, then the ITC is not going to have a, as a practical matter, power right. over them. Right. Um, we're talking about stuff that's imported. Um, and then the second remedy is um, in personam. It's over the individual parties that mm-hmm. have been brought before the ITC and subject to uh, an ordinary... U.S. government agency action, those parties can receive specific to them cease and desist orders. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I I think like, you know, we may need to like, you know, exclusion order is essentially an order like, you know, of of, uh, uh, prohibiting importation of certain goods for a period of time. But for certain industries, it could be uh, lethal, (laughs) fatal, right? Like, you know, if like, you know, a generation of phones is not on the market for like, say, a year or a year and a half, then it's it's over, right? The whole generation of electronic goods might not be able to see the light of the market at all. And then I, one would, someone would even further argue that the ITC uh, proceeding had some even more powerful effects or incentives for plaintiffs uh, in the procedural side, right? The ITC proceeding is usually much faster than a federal court proceeding if similar facts or disputes were presented. Is that right? So let's let's um, let's take the topics one at a time. On the question of the power of the remedy, depending mm-hmm. on which way the average listener falls on the politics of COVID, um, <laughs> blocking a, a lot of trade into our country either was really good or really bad, mm-hmm. or didn't matter, or mattered a lot, or didn't really happen and wasn't very effective or was super effective. Mm -hmm. So I I, I think there are a lot of empirical questions in there where many sides of many political debates, in fact, point in both directions. And the actual science, the actual data is way murkier. It's, Mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot, it's a lot more gray than black and white. Um, Mm -hmm. I think, um, again, on this question, though, of bringing stuff into the market, um, for 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 some famous economists who are famously skeptical of market interventions, one of their famous cries has been, uh, "Gosh, if inexpensive stuff is being pushed into the U.S. markets, why don't U.S. market participants loudly say thank you?" rather than complain. And and I think that it is, again, important to emphasize that while it is probably selfishly a good idea to thank people for inexpensive stuff, Mm -hmm. this was not a complaint about price being low. This was a complaint about collusion. Mm -hmm. And even highly... uh, um, antitrust skeptical economists who are highly skeptical of government intervention in markets, even they generally find in their hearts and in their heads a fair amount of room for anti-collusion legislation. Mm-hmm. So I think it's, it, it's, again, vital to emphasize this was a collusion case, not a dumping case. <laughs> Yep, um, yep. But on, on the question then about um, how, um, how to kind of analyze or understand the process at the ITC 337 docket compared to the process inside a district court or inside an antitrust, uh, um, a more traditional antitrust um, docket like 
the Federal Trade Commission Section 5 docket, Mm -hmm. I think there are a few things to keep in mind. Yes, ITC 337 is colloquially called a rocket docket. It is (laughs) fast, on average 18 months start to finish. It is not, on average, cheaper or less expensive than Mm -hmm. a seven-year U.S. District Court patent or antitrust complicated case. Um, It is about the same price for both the plaintiff and the defendant um, in terms of overall attorney's fees and litigation costs. Mm -hmm. But that cost is compressed into 18 months. Mm -hmm. Now, like a district court action, Because of the structure of the ITC that we started discussing at the start of this podcast, um, ITC decisions, determinations are long and boring to read (laughs) and heavily footnoted and grounded in a big, fat, super heavy, thick, totally guaranteed to put you to sleep factual (laughs) record. Um, Now, if what you like about adjudication is that it be highly political, don't build a detailed factual record. If what you want is um, folly, fashion, politics to be deciding your cases, then you should pour a lot of money down K Street, lobby a whole lot, and go to an agency that's highly responsive to political pressure of one political party in power, mm. hope to God that it's the party you've been funding and not their <laughs> opponent, and uh, and go in that direction. And then you can get, I guess, um, a more predictable result in the sense <laughs> of buying your politicians and buying your influence. But that doesn't seem to be highly analytical and it's not the kind of predictability that markets really like markets do prefer objective decision making and the 337 docket like the district court docket it's not always correct Mm -hmm. but at least it's much more transparent and grounded in a factual record not because there's something magical Mm -hmm. about the hearts or heads of (laughs) district court judges or ITC commissioners, but rather because district court judges and ITC commissioners operate in a part of the government that is by statute structurally engineered to create Mm -hmm. the kind of political and power dynamics where it doesn't generally work that well to be highly politically responsive. That doesn't mean that politics don't enter our courts. It doesn't mean that politics don't enter the ITC. But it does mean that our society has made deliberate choices. We picked Article 3 different than Article 1. Um, (laughs) We picked um, six-member chair rotating commissions different Mm -hmm. than five-members chair commissions. sustaining commissions, uh, we, we pick these different structures knowing full well they have a radically different impact on the way right. those bodies operate. Right. Well, I think, it's Scott, something- it's, it, it's appropriate for us to close out the conversation where we started it, which is sort of, you know, the structural differences of the ITC versus other agencies. And it also does sound like through our conversation that, you know, some concerns around a slippery slope of antitrust jurisprudence kind of floating into the ITC and the FTC is not, is perhaps to your point of a, a bit of a red herring. Nonetheless, an ITC is a, is a robust forum um, for potential resolution of these disputes and something we should keep an eye out for going forward um, as litigants may look for or forum shop and, and view the ITC as a useful forum for, for whatever, you know, their end goal is. Um, we are, are, are unfortunately out of time, but before we let you go, um, we did want to ask you a couple of questions. Um, I'm just going to jump right into advice that you have for young professionals. You have a storied resume that Anora previewed at the beginning of the episode. <laughs> you've played, you know, you've worn a lot of hats. Um, I'm sure our listeners would be interested in hearing about your experience and what you would recommend or ha- advice for them um, that you have. 
Sure. So the the um, um, my first advice is um, it really is going to be hard um, following up on arguments about um, the substantive antitrust rules about uh, error costs and proxy effects. It's really hard to predict the future. So I would tell students and and professionals don't try too hard to find what's going to be perfect for you five years from now, mostly because none of us knows what the world's going to be like five years from now. And that means each of you as each of us as individuals, none of us knows what we're going to feel about it. So we can't make a great strategic decision about it. So what matters most for young professionals and students is not which topic they pick to focus on, but rather that they pick a topic to focus on. Getting it uh, done, getting it decided, throwing yourselves into it matters much more than picking the best one. There is no best one. Um, it's not knowable. Um, so my, my first real advice is whatever students and professionals are flirt flirting with in their minds as um, classes to take or practice groups to join, um, don't worry about don't worry about maximizing. Um, instead, worry about throwing themselves in. The act of throwing yourself in, that act of engaging, it will be fun. It will be productive. It will help your teammates. It will help society, and it will allow you to build muscles um, and judgment and insight. And all of those things will be useful to the you of tomorrow. Great. Um, and now for our final segment, what we call the Curious Hat. And now it's time for the Curious Hat. So Scott, um, I'm going to ask you pick a number one through ten. Lucky seven. Lucky seven. Uh, okay, this will be, good, uh, I think, a good one for you. So tell us about a teacher who had a major influence on you. <laughs> um, sure. Judge Rich, um, I worked for him uh, early in my career after I had practiced for a little while. Um, I worked for him as a law clerk, so in a sense he was my boss, not my teacher. The thing about Judge Rich is that he taught without trying to teach. And he did that because he learned, and he learned because he wanted to learn. He was a deeply curious person. And um, he was curious about people. He was curious about stuff. Um, so uh, he taught me a lot. He taught me to be even more curious. And um, we certainly do live in a time where things are curiouser and curiouser. And so I would encourage us all to be curious, be curious about each other, be curious about what's going on. That's very fitting for a podcast named Our Curious Malcolm. And with that, Scott, we'll close out. Thank you again for joining us um, today. And to our listeners, thanks for listening to this episode of Our Curious Malcolm. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Our Curious Amalgam, a competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law podcast. It is produced and shared around the globe by ABA's Antitrust Law Section. The opinions expressed by the participants in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent their employer or other organizations. If you like what you heard or would like to become a member of the American Bar Association, please check out what the Antitrust section has to offer at ambar.org antitrust. You can learn more about our podcast at, at OurCuriousAmalgam.com. If you have comments, suggestions, or podcast ideas, please reach out to us at podcast at OurCuriousAmalgam.com. Until next time, thank you for listening.